that have the word there's new there's no two places alike amen but i can find a place that's good ground and where i hear the word of god and i'm being taught the word of god and i can grow there and begin to build relationships amen in that particular church so we just thank god for jesus christ amen and all the wonderful things that he's done and once again amen we're going to mission and so we're going to keep in touch we already know that we're going to keep in touch as uh, uh you'd be one of those our, our partners in ministry Okay, well, let's get ready for the Word of God. Praise the Lord. It's time to get into this thing. This is going to be, um, if you're going to clap, clap. Go clap. And that's, and, and that's just say, Lord, thank you. Now, uh, we have, uh, let me say this to, before we, uh, well, let me dismiss the youth first. The youth, uh, you're dismissed to your classes. Children's Church, you're dismissed to your classes. Praise God. Thank God for you all. Amen. Let the children, let the children. Let the cheering go. Praise God. Amen. And you know, when we were growing up, we didn't have children's church in church. We had to sit in church. And then, you know, you, you have, for those of you who grew up in church, you knew that in church you don't act up. You don't talk. You have to just sit there. And really, it was almost like punishment. Really, it was almost like punishment. I couldn't do nothing. And then if I did something, if I a little antsy, you know, you just feel your mother eyes on the back of your neck. Or if you look over there and she's just looking dead at you. And then my eyes are saying, boy, when you get home, and then for the rest of the service, you in fear. <laughs> so we have a youth ministry. So let your children go to youth ministry. So everybody be taught in their envi environment. It also allows the parents or adults for you to be taught without distraction. So we try to provide everything for everybody. We have the nursery that's going on, the youth church is going on, the teen ministry going on, and we have, amen, our adult ministry, amen, going on. And for those of you who are viewing via social, social media, we're glad to have you with us. Uh, <coughs> hopefully, it, it looks as though we cleared up our glitch for the last two weeks because people have been calling in. Hey, listen, I thank God for you calling in because it tells me you care. And that this message, this service is very important to you. So continue to watch. Amen. Listen and obey the word of God. All right. Let's get into our word. Open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 25. <clears throat> for those of you who always want prayer before we start our lesson, let me pray for you. In Jesus' name, we thank you for the word. Amen. Amen. Okay. So you had your prayer. Now, see, sometimes people are, tradi people are so traditional that, oh, he didn't pray. He didn't pray. So I, I, it's almost like, okay, let me do this to help people so that people can get bogged down. It's amazing how we get bogged down with tradition. Uh, tradition on um, even when coming to church, we think that uh, if we were, we think there's certain attire that has to be worn when you go to church. You have to do, you know, shirt and tie, and et cetera. Well, when you go into third world countries, they don't have all that clothing, but they sure worship the Lord. So clothing is not important to God. Amen. Look at your coverings. Your clothes are not important to God. God is looking at what? Your heart. And so we want heart worship. We're not here just to uh, go through a formality and, 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 and present this, this wonderful picture of Christians serving the Lord and really don't have him in our heart. We don't want to do that. We want to be real. <clears throat> All right. This is lesson number six. <clears throat> and this is our final lesson in the Christian lifestyle. We're starting a new series on Father's Day. On Father's Day, you don't want to miss it. Bring your friends, your relatives, your family. Bring them out because we're going to be dealing with eternity. All right, we're going to be dealing with some stuff that's coming about. It's about to happen. And people need to know that eternity is real. So often people are building a life on this planet. We put so much effort into our jobs and our homes and cars and things of that nature. And you know you're going to die. You know you're going to die. You can't take it with you. But one thing we need to invest in, and that is our, our spiritual life in Christ Jesus, because that's eternal. Amen. That never dies. And so, uh, so next, next week on Father's Day, since it's Father's Day, amen, we're going to start a new series. Open your Bibles if you don't have it already. Ephesians, if you haven't found it already, rather, it's in the New Testament. So 
if you over, if you close to Genesis or Exodus, you're in the wrong half of the Bible. Go to the other half in Ephesians. That therefore put away lying. Let every one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. That word let means don't you let. So this is a personal scripture. When Paul is addressing the Christians, he's ta- this, is, this is a personal scripture. You can put your name in here. I can say Clarence. Okay? Don't let no evil communication come out of your mouth. See, it can be personal. And we have to take this word personally. Don't think that, that God is just talking to people of old and it didn't, he didn't include you. What he had the Holy Spirit write in Scripture includes people from every walk of life in every generation on this earth. So let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness... Wrath, anger, now it has wrath and anger. So wrath and anger are not the same thing. Wrath and clamor, evil speaking, he said, be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So here we see Paul, he's not addressing a group of unbelievers Paul, he's addressing Christians. He said, you all need to put this stuff away. Now, you can't put something, it's not logical for him to tell you to put something away if it's already put away. You don't tell your children, clean, clean up your room, the room's already clean. There's a reason you tell you, wash the dishes. Well, there's a reason you tell them to wash the dishes, because the dishes have not been washed. Okay. Pick up your clothes. Why do you tell them to pick up your clothes? Because... Clothes are on the floor you see, or on, land on the chair or land on the bed. So when Paul says for us, he says, put away lying, he's talking to Christians who've been lying. Every, every one of us were born liars. You might want to turn to your neighbor and say, yeah, you too? Because I know it's kind of... Y- 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 you, you, you don't see yourself, but we know better. Everybody, you are a natural born liar. You don't want to hear that, but naturally, you, we, were, we were born in sin. That's what the Bible says. Born in sin, shaped in iniquity. I mean, born in sin and shaped. Born and shaped. And all it has to do is say, so we were born liars. We were born thieves. It's, you don't have to teach your children to steal. You don't have to teach them to lie. You know they, there's nobody in the house but you and them. <laughs> the candy did not open itself by itself. Who opened the candy? I don't know. <laughs> we all been there, all done that. And, and, and so w- those things are... They just come. So Paul is telling us that there has to be an effort put forth to stop things. You just don't stop them because you're a Christian. When you came to God, you you still lied. And if you said, no, you didn't, yes, you did. You just lied. (laughs) We had to to learn how to, to control our mouth, and we control our mouth by our thoughts. We had to learn how to control, and we control our thoughts by our spirit. What's in your spirit is going to come to your head. What's in your head is going to come out of your mouth. So if you haven't been transformed, you can't stop lying. You can't, as much as you like to tell the truth. I'll give you an example. Some of us lied this week just to help you out. 
Somebody asked you, you were, you were upset with somebody, and somebody said to you, what's wrong? And you said nothing. You just lied. Rather than facing the truth, you told a lie. And the Bible said we're supposed to speak, we're supposed to speak the truth. But because you, you didn't want to let no, somebody know that you were upset, what's wrong? Nothing. You can tell by your attitude something's wrong. So Paul, he's addressing Christians about being transformed. Now, last week, I mentioned something to you about being a Christian. I said that all Christians aren't Christians. All Christians aren't Christians. What do you mean Christian? They're not walking like Christ. That's what Christian means, to be Christ-like. So everybody called Christians are not walking like Christians. And we're supposed to have a certain lifestyle that identifies us with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying he, there, there's a need for a transformed life, and a transformed life is manifested outwardly. If you're saying, I love God, I love God, and people don't see God in you, that's a problem. That's a problem. That's an issue. There ought to be some evidence that you are guilty of being a Christian. Some evidence. If you were in court, that somebody will have something to say about you being a Christian. You go to court and they put you on trial by, by, for being a Christian. They bring up witnesses. What are those witnesses going to say about you? I never saw them read no Bible. Never invited me to church. Matter of fact, they only go every other Sunday. And sometimes they miss that. So what's the evidence that's against you that you're a Christian? And it's not from you. It's from those around you. Will, somebody, will the courts convict you of being a Christian based on what people say about you? Or will it be a hung jury? <laughs> or will you be declared innocent? That's the worst. Yeah, Dennis, I, he, he is assistant pastor of the Rise Church. He don't ever do nothing. Innocent or guilty? And, and you already know the answer. See how quiet it is? Nobody's talking now. You already know the answer. Now, look at number one on your outline. The word Christian was given to the early followers of Jesus, and the name has been passed down throughout the years. Now, technically, the ending of Christians, I-A-N, is Christ I-A-N. Is that right? When you spell Christian, Christ, I-A-N. That's the ending. The ending means, I-A-N means belonging to the party of. So when you say Christians, it means that if you say you're a Christian, you belong to the party of Christ. You belong to the party of Christ. And they were first called Christians in Antioch because they resemble the teachings and actions of Jesus. So the disciples, they, they, people looked at the disciples and said, they sound like Jesus. They walk like Jesus. They talk like Jesus. They speak like Jesus. A matter of fact, they, all the, the works that they do, they, they do some of the same works Jesus did. Are you listening to me? So when we examine our lives, you really, really need to check yourself. Don't check out your neighbor. Check yourself out and see where you are. Are you really an I-A-N? Are you an I-N? Christian? Are you really that? Are you really attached to the party of Christ? It's been passed down that those who follow Christ... They respond a certain way. They walk a certain way. They talk a certain way. They act a certain way. 
That's how you identify Christians. Christians, we identify Christians because they go to church or because they say they're Christians. But we have to be able to look at their lives. Now, I'm not here to judge you, and, and, and you're not here to judge me. That's not what this is all about. But if you say you're going you to be a Christian, be a Christian. Stop messing up our, our gig. We're saying it's like a bad policeman messes up the ideology of what people think about the other good ones. A, a, a greedy preacher, it messes up people's thoughts about the decent ones, the good ones. You know, a, 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 a bad husband. Y'all, y'all, y'all got the picture. A bad he messes up people's mind about men. Women think about men. And, and a bad woman. Come on, brother, let me give me amen on you. Cause the women show sure saying amen on you. <laughs> a, a, a woman who just just is go go crazy. It, it, it messes up with. I mean, uh, here's a young man watching you all, and we're acting crazy out here. Not having a good family relationship, family dynamics is all off the chart. We're arguing in the car, in, in, the, in the parking lot, then coming here and lift our hands to the Lord. Then we go back and pick up where we left off when we came through the door. And people see that. You mean to tell me since you've been in church, nothing changed? What have you been listening to? There ought to be some change in our lives. And God requires change. When, you know, I told you, whenever I minister, I preach a change. And I'm not here to help you feel good. You, you want a feel-good message? Uh, tomorrow about 3 o'clock, I think it was Channel 8, you can turn on uh, Dr. Phil. <laughs> on my direct TV. It's channel, you, you watch Dr. Phil. Dr. Phil, Dr. Phil, good. I'm not here to make you feel good. We're here to tell you about the Word to keep you out of hell. And also so that your life on this earth could, could be patterned after what God has purposed for you. He wants you to be happy. He wants you to be prosperous. Amen. And yet when we don't listen to God and then when we have problems, we want to blame him. Well, where was God? He's always been there. It's not where was God. It's where were you? Number two, being a Christian is about a friendship, a friendship with the Lord Jesus. It's not a bunch of uh, rules and regulations, performing rituals, and even going to church. Going to church don't make you a Christian. We got devils here. Devils go to church. I know because I was one of them. Yeah, well, I, I don't want to go. Well, I would look for, I would look for a, a girlfriend. I go to church. Well, that's what all the good ones were, I thought. <laughs> now, I found out there were some of them just, girls just like me. Yeah, they're looking for, for some dudes or, or guys. I say guys. Back in the day, it was dudes. They are, they're looking for guys. And, and, and we're, guy looking for girls, girls looking for guys. And it's, th that's not what it's about. You go to church and still get messed up. Christians have married Christians and, and boom. Oop, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> It went, just, it, went, it, went, it, went, it went sour. Why? Because if you don't have Christ in your relationship, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, how are you have a relationship with somebody else? It's really, when, when you are, how many married people, or ma married or married people do I have in the room? Raise your hand. If you've been married, if you were married, okay, put your hand down. How many of you really understood marriage when you first got married? It was, it was trial and error. And still sometimes it's trial and error. There is no, there is no, hand, I don't care how many counselors, there's no handbook that's going to get you through a relationship on this planet. God, if you don't have God in your relationship, I guarantee you it's going to be, if you, if you make it, if you make it, you're going to struggle. And that's a big if. Now, there's people who have gone through a life, and, and, and they've, had a, they've had a good marriage, but it wasn't a great marriage. 
there's a difference between the two. You can get married, oh, it's good. But with God, God makes it great. Because there's things that you just can't handle naturally. You can't handle by yourself. And we suffer through things. We permit things, allow things. We don't grow through things. We just endure them. And too, pe- too many people endure relationships. Well, I, or we call it this. We call it put up with. You just put up with them. And because, well, hey, I don't know if I'm going to find anything better. What an attitude. You, it's not that you're trying to look for anyone better. You want to make what you have work, but it takes God for it to work. See? And once, I, once you have a relationship with God, I, then I know how to treat my spouse. I know how to treat my kids. Most of them have a relationship with God. We just got married, and then we got, God came in later after our kids was all messed up. They twitching off onto the side. <laughs> <laughs> and they walking down the street crooked. Because <laughs> we done messed them up. We didn't know what we were doing. We were talking every time they, every time they do something sassy, we slap them or hit them or beat them. Never told her, listen, how to be an a, a, a example or a guide for those children, how to lead them being a, a, a living example by your speech and by your action. They learn more, kids learn more by seeing rather than hearing. They see you. Yeah, girl, don't talk like that. And, and, and if they could, they'd tell you, Mama, that's how you talk. But they don't, they're scared you're going to slap them. <laughs> uh, look at your neighbor and say, are you sure this is the last message? <laughs> <laughs> Go to John 15 and 12. John 15 and 12 said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love have no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his Friends, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Did y'all hear that? You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. Jesus is saying this. There is no way that we should be living and not know what God commands of us. He said, I, 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 look, he said, look, you're not servants anymore. You, you're, you're my friend. So I'm telling you what I want. And Jesus, God has, has spelled out everything he wants for us in those 66 books that he left us. He gave us instructions. He, he gave us warnings. Okay? He, he gave us a system to follow if we want to prosper. And then he tells you if you don't prosper, he said there's a system for failure. He shows you both sides of it. He shows you good and he shows you evil. He shows right and wrong. He, 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 he gives us uh, 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 ideas of, uh, and he gives us examples of what happened in the past and what will happen to you if you continue going down that road. And then he lets you know if you want to change the way you're going, this is how you do it. All that stuff is in the Bible. So you, you can't say that, well, God, I didn't know. You don't know because you didn't read. Like men putting bicycles, bicycles and things together on Christmas. Here's a manual, but I don't need it. Then you got all these nuts and bolts left over, left over you know, while your kid's swinging, going down a hill on a, on a bicycle. And he can't stop. Because you forgot, you don't know where this nut, you, they don't give you extra nuts in the package. They give you just enough, and method they give you enough to let you know that if something is on, if, if something, if you have something left over, you left something off. That's what it's for. Then they give you a, a diagram of the tools you're supposed to use. They, they measure the nuts. This is the size of bolt and washer, so you put everything together. But see, you know, you know what you're doing. <laughs> just like some of us with God, we know what we're doing. We don't need the manual. We watch other people. I'm watching other people and I'm letting them guide me. That's the worst thing you can do. Because even people who you think is saved, sometimes they're not saved. And you think they're telling you the truth. No. They're giving you a form of the gospel. But they're not teaching you the gospel. 
It's important for us to know ourselves. When you, when you go to your job, it's important for you to read the manual for yourself. You cannot tell your boss, well, I didn't know. He said, I gave you a manual. He said, well, 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 Jim didn't tell me that. Well, Jim's not responsible for you. You are responsible for you. So the Bible tells us to work out our own soul, soul salvation in fear and trembling. That's something that we're supposed to do. So Jesus goes on to say, he says, no longer do I call you servants, but a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I call you friends. For all things that I heard of my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me. Uh, Y'all ever hear that song? I found the Lord Jesus. Jesus never been lost. Okay. Jesus wasn't lost. You were lost. And so here he says, you did not choose me. I chose you. Let's just go and get it right. You, oh, I, I chose you. No, he chose you. Okay. And appointed you that you should go and do what? Bear fruit. And that your fruit should remain. For whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Wow. What a blessing. When I know the will of my Father, when I know that Jesus is my friend, when I'm friends with Jesus. See, Jesus, is what a friend we have in Jesus. But are you Jesus' friend? Now, Jesus is our friend. But are you his friend? Because that's the relationship. And, and, and it's a beautiful thing about, uh, about friendship is that, and I'll share this a little later on, in friendship, that when you walk with somebody, if you're walking down the, uh, uh, the, on the beach or, or you're going for a walk or, uh, on an evening walk, you two friends, you're sharing stuff. Now, all the beauty that's around you, you can admire, but you, all the beauty you see, you share it with your friend. There's nothing that interrupts the relationship that you're having when two people are walking together. The most important, because of the friendship. Number three, after placing trust in Jesus, a person should begin to walk in a new direction. Scripture uh, describes, rather, the relationship people have with God as a walk. If we're going to have a relationship, it says we, uh, we walk with God. Now, we hear this in the Bible, walking with God. Oh, I, I want to walk with God. Well, listen, you walk with God because you're friends. That's the relationship. When you have a relationship with God, he's your friend. You can walk with God. You know, we have this idea, well, I, I need to do this and I need to do that. I need to clean up this and clean up that. No, God wants you just as ragged, a ragtag, whatever you are. He, and, and, and he doesn't care what you got on. He don't care if you have makeup, no makeup. That's not God. Well, well you know, I, I still have a problem with my temper. D don't worry. You can still walk with God. God didn't tell you to do anything to walk with him. He just needs a relationship. Once you establish that relationship, you can walk with God. And not thinking that you're unworthy. No, you were unworthy. He made you worthy by sending his son. So, so scripture tells us that from the very beginning, men walk with God. Now, let me, I want to give you some scripture just to, just to help you out. You don't have to be perfect. Don't think you, you oh, I, I'll have to do something. You don't have to do anything to establish that relationship with God. Genesis 5.22. I'm going to read Genesis, a few scriptures out of Genesis. Enoch lived 65 years, and he begot Methuselah. He was 65 years old when he had a, a son. Well, yeah, I, I'm with you on that. Hmm. Okay, we told my wife, no, it's It's over. No more kids. No, that's, oh, that's Enoch. Let, let's, let, let's thank God for Enoch. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years. Wow. And had sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Now, here's, here's one of the few times in the Bible where God took a man. When you die, God don't take people when they die. We said, oh, I love the Lord. The Lord saw fit to take him. No, God didn't take him. Death took him. He died. 
God didn't come down and say, it's time to go. And he just collapsed. That's not what it is. Either you have a heart attack, something malfunctioned in your body to cause you to die. Or your body to shut down. That's a better way. So your body shut down, but you don't shut down. You, you, you keep living. So Enoch walked with God, and God took him. In other words, this is what the Bible says. Enoch was walking along one day with the Lord, and the Lord says, come on, Enoch. E Enoch did not die. He just took him to glory. And he wasn't even a saved man. He wasn't, he wasn't redeemed from the inside like we are, but he walked with God. All right, let's, let's look at another one. Genesis 9, 6 and 9. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generation. Noah walked with God. Now, when the Bible says Noah was perfect, don't think he was without flaw. Noah had some problems. Hello. Now, Noah said, well, but Noah, he had faith. He, he built the ark. Do, don't you know that, that the, 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 how did Noah know that it was God talking to him? How would Noah know that God wants to build him a boat? Nobody ever built a boat, and then God said, it's going to rain. What is rain? Because it didn't rain. There was, there was no rain. It was dew. Dew, dew covered the earth, and, and, and he said, it's going to rain. And then he says, and here's Noah building this, how many, building this, this, this ship for 120 years. Y'all know that's a problem. On one job, 120 years. Yeah, see, don't y'all look at me like, oh, just 120 years? 120 years? That's, his, that's your whole life. Plus 40 or 50. And he was continuing building that ship. And people say, what in the world are you doing? Where are you going to build a boat on dry land? But what they didn't know, there was water under the earth. People have this idea that it rained 40 days and it rained 40 nights. And there wasn't no land in sight. That's where we, we get our song. It rained, but that's not where the water of the floods came from. The Bible said the earth opened up and the waters came up. So we had waters coming up and water coming down. And then it, it, it lifted that boat up. But Noah wasn't a perfect man. You know that after he landed. <laughs> Y'all... See, so read your Bible. You need to check out what he did after he landed. All right, let me move on because you, so y'all can go walk with God. <laughs> Genesis 48 and 15. And he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my father Abraham and Isaac walked. Abraham and Isaac walked. They walked before God. It was, so it means they live. If you li if you read the story of Abraham, Abraham is kind of like believers today. He lied. Abraham was afraid. He walked in fear when he went to Egypt because Sarah she was so beautiful, and the king wanted her for his wife. So Abraham said, "So when we get down there, get Egypt, uh, uh." Uh, tell them you're my sister. And then, and, and, and then when the king took the woman, and, and not, not have no sex involved, he, he, he took her for her beauty, and, and God intervened, and he brought some terrible pain on them people. And, the king, and then the king had a dream, what Abraham did. And he went to Abraham and said, why do you do this to me? Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? You, you have to understand something, that through Sarah, Jesus was coming. And God was not going to allow anybody or anything interrupt his plan. Not even Abraham with, with his lying self. 
But then the Bible says he walked with God. So that means that God is not looking for perfect people. He's just looking for willing hearts. He's not looking for someone who's just matured. He wants somebody who just loves him for who he is. He's not looking for no, this, some intelligent conversation. He's looking for you just to talk to him. Thank you, Father. I appreciate everything you've done for me. Yeah. Lord, you're good. Just talk to God. No, I'm not going through some hissy fit. Just talk to him. Lord, you're good. You know, thank you for this wonderful day. It's just a blessing. You know, praise God. Just talk with God. And let me tell you another way you, you walk with God. When you walk with your brother and sister, and you walk with them in peace, and you walk with them in harmony, you're walking with God. Because it's God in them. So we have to be careful. That's why when Paul first started out, he said, look, you guys got to treat one another right. Love one another. It's amazing. You have to teach the Christians how to love. And we have to teach Christians how to love because love is not automatic because you become a Christian. You have to learn how to do that. You have to learn how to, how to endure, not put up with, how to endure hardships as a good soldier. Because when somebody don't treat you kind, you got to know how to endure past that. Because everybody that's in your church is not mature. You have babies in your church. You have kids in your church. When I say children, I mean they have adult form, but they are, they're just starting out. They don't know everything about God. So we have to learn how to be patient. You can't bring people in here and start stripping them down. What you doing with that? On? You ain't supposed to come to church like that. Well, I thought I was coming to God, not you. You may not want to receive me like that, but God will receive me. He says, come as you are. And come as your army, come as you are. So, you know, so we have to transform and change our mind of what we're thinking about people and how we, how we accept people in the church. It's not based on what they look like and what they're wearing. It's just a desire they won't be part of the, the, the Rise Church family. We're part of the family of God. And then we want to run them away because they don't look like us. They don't talk like us. What does that mean? God is saying, God is looking down on you and him and saying, you sure don't talk like us either. <laughs> and you're not looking like us. We, when you're judging others, you're being judged yourself. Stay away from it. All right. Now, walking, walking with God. What is walking with God? What happens when we walk with someone? Let's imagine this. Imagine you and a close friend are enjoying a morning walk. You are in close proximity. You talk. You laugh. You listen. You share your hearts. Attention is focused on this person to the exclusion of almost everything else around you. I watched this when I watched uh, two, uh, two women or two men just walking. M men maybe exercise, when women are walking, and they're just walking and talking. They're passing up all kind of things, cars passing, you, you name it, passing uh, uh, beautiful scenery, beautiful homes, and they're, all they do, they're focused on each other, and they're having a healthy conversation. You notice the beauty around you on an occasional distraction, but the only point, the main point is to your companion or the person that you're walking with. You notice beauty, but it doesn't distract you. You share it together. You are in harmony and you both enjoy peaceful companionship. Do you know when you walk and talk with somebody, there's so much peace in there? Versus walking and arguing with somebody? Just walking and talking. Some people, you get together, they walk so they can, you walk to lose weight. That's not the only way you lose weight. You walk to lose weight. The other way, you push away, do push away. Push away from the table a little bit. <laughs> and you watch what you eat. I'm just saying, you know, everybody walking, not just somebody out there to lose weight. They're just walking for exercise to stimulate the heart. When's the last time some of you took a walk? Uh-oh. Okay, go. I heard friend go on. <laughs> no, seriously. You have to exercise. My wife would tell you, I, I, golf, I, I go out and practice almost every day. So why do you want to go out there and practice golf? Because it's, it's cardio for me. It's exercise. It's something I enjoy doing. And I'll do it religiously 
every day. And if I miss it, I miss it. It's okay. Okay. But I, then I get right back in it. That's what I do. I swing my club. And that's, I don't have back problems because it keeps me loose. If, uh, if you go to your doctor and they tell you, they'll tell you golf is good for that. Y'all, y'all didn't know that? Yeah, it's good for you because you, you, you're swinging, you're moving, you move your arms, you move your legs. Uh, it's, 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 a challenging, it's a challenging game, but the thing is there's a lot of exercise because in golf you walk. If it's too long, I get me a cart. <laughs> I still got to get back home to my wife. Y'all seen Pastor? Yeah, he left at 6 this morning. Well, his sun's going down. Has he ain't made it past the ninth hole yet? <laughs> no. So, but it's walking. It's exercise. It's, it's, and that's why I love it. I love doing something. extra. And then I, I'll get out and I work in my yard. I, I don't do that because I have to. Can't you pay somebody to do it? Yeah, I can. But sometimes I just want to get out there and, and get my fingers in dirt. Just get dirty. Just, just get reconnected to what I was created out of. Dirt. Some of y'all get dirty. Some of y'all, get, yeah, ooh, dirt. That's what you made of. <laughs> Look at you, you dirty person. You walking with a friend. Walking with number four. Walking with a friend requires saying no to many other things. So walking with God requires letting go of anything that would be a distraction. Many people attempt to walk with God and they bring along bad habits, worldly entertainments, and unhealthy relationships. They know these things are not God's choice for them, but they pretend everything is fine. If you want to be successful in life, you must have a personal relationship with God. Here's what's going to happen. You can go along in life and everything could be working well. I mean, everything is clicking on all cylinders. But at the time you least expect it, that wall is going to come down. And you won't have anything to stand on. That's the deception of seeking worldly goods. It's important that we make God number one priority in our life. We don't substitute anything for him. I don't substitute golf for for church. Everything is balanced. Time for golf, time time for family, time for church. Time for others, time for this, time for that. You, You have to balance that. If we're focused on making a life for yourself, In this world, you're going to be disappointed. Or you're going to get to the end and realize that that stuff wasn't important at all, and you're going to know how much you've lost in your relationship with people. You spend time with your spouse or spend time with your children. You spend time with God. But if we don't have our our lives balanced with God, family, church, Others, if we don't balance that, and it's out of whack, it's out of whack if God's not number one. You got family, you know, then you have yourself and things, and you got others. I don't care what you, how you arrange it, it's out of whack if God is not in first place. And I just want to encourage you, listen, people, that God has, he wants these wonderful things for us, but. And he wants you to be successful. And, and you would actually, I found that when you put God first, you put forth less effort with greater reward than not having God and put in all this effort and have little reward. God brings you increase. He brings a greater increase with less. Figure that out. God will bring more with less. When you do less and God do more, you get more. When you do more and you have God doing less, you get less. Even though your less may be satisfactory to you, is not God's best. So there is a system to this. And when we line it with that system, then we see that, that God, he's really, he, he's my friend. He cares about me. To walk with God means that you and God are in agreement about your life. <laughs> is God in agreement about your life? Uh, Amos 3 and 3 says, how can two walk together except they be agreed? 
So to walk with God means to be aligned, is to have aligned your will with his and seek every day to consider yourself crucified with Jesus. Every day you check, every day you put yourself in check. Well, okay, well, how do I line up today? You got to be, what's, what's, what, what am I going to do today? I know some of us are excellent planners. You got your day all planned out. God's an excellent plan wrecker. He loves just wrecking your plans. Because your plans is what you think. Your plans is what you think that should happen today. Then God will throw something in there. He said, okay, hold up, hold up. Or something go awry in your plans and it messes up your whole day. When God said, all you had to do was do this. And no matter what happened during your day, you have an excellent day. The thing about it, when you walk with the Lord, your, your day is never messed up. Because he already tells us that things are going to happen. They're going to come. So to walk with God means to align our will with his. We don't have to be perfect because none of us are. But our heart's desire should be to please the Lord. And if we are willing to have the Holy Spirit to work within us, then he will conform us to look like, walk like, and talk like God. How many times during the day do you ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what should I do here? Yeah. Holy Spirit, because he's your instructor. You have a personal trainer 24-7, and most of us don't use him. He's there 24-7 to, to give you whatever you need, information. He feels that. Um, I mean, he keeps you from trouble. He, he protects you, and he covers you. My wife, I tell you, every time she, when she go out and... And she, she don't like drive, you know, when she drives, she don't like uh, park way down. I park way down there because I don't like dents in my car. Yeah, people just open the door up on it. I stay saved by parking way on the other end. And she'll just say, she, she, she put her angels out. I need some. She said, I need some close. And, you know, I started thinking, I said, well, wait a minute. Why can't I say, Lord, give me some close and, and keep people from denting my car? Then they ain't got to walk so far. <laughs> I said, oh, I start thinking about like my wife. You get me clothes. Give me a parking spot. And she, she just put her angels out. Give me a parking spot. And she goes, whoop, pull right on in there. You know? Do you ask the angel to protect your car from dents? No. She too busy thinking about that dress in that store now. Ooh, I got my parking spot. Macy's, Nordstrom's. She, she too busy going. Just take a few seconds, baby, and just say, please, Lord. Holy angels, protect this car. In Jesus' name, no more, no dents. Oh, she said, people going to do what people do, and the angels going to do what angels do. <laughs> Amen. They're going to do what I told them to do. Protect that car. <laughs> Praise God. Now, look, Jesus invites us to follow him and to walk in his footsteps. Go to 1 Peter. We're almost done here. 1 Peter 2, 2.21. 2, for to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. That we should follow his steps. We should follow his what? Steps. Number five. As God's children, we, as God's children, we're also to walk weightly. That is, leaving an imprint and an influence wherever we go. We should leave an imprint. Can somebody say you were here based on your footprint? Based on what you did? Did you, did you make an imprint on somebody's life? Did you influence somebody? There should be an imprint or influence. Something ought to be left behind to say that you were here. Amen. You were here. And so in Galatians says, Galatians uh, 5.16 I say then, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Flesh, rather, flesh. <laughs> flesh. <laughs> we are em employed to walk in a manner that's worthy of the calling with which we have been called. That's what God is telling us. Walk worthily. So it, it, when we think about, think about the people that cross your path every day. When people cross your path, are you influencing them? 
Is there some type of impact or imprint that you're leaving? Are we reflecting Jesus in some way that people can see Christ in our life? Our life, as friends of God, rather, we must do more than simply sit and listen to sermons and Bible teaching. You got to do more than that. Our life must change so that everybody who meets us will meet Christ or Jesus in us. Our old life, how we live before meeting the Lord, was self-centered. Our new life is to be Christ-centered. So before, instead of focusing on you, and that will tell you where you are. Are you focused on Christ or are you focused on you? And men, don't think that, you know, I, I, have to make a, I have to make this wonderful living for my family. The most important impact or imprint that you can leave for your family, your children, and your spouse is being a man of God. How faithful you were to God. How consistent you were. It doesn't matter where your children are. It really don't. If you start the process, God can start his. The change has to first begin in you. And once, once it begins in you, then it can spread abroad. I know some people say, Pastor, I, you know, I, I, I messed up. <clears throat> I messed up and my, uh, my family is, is just seem to be just torn apart, seem to be just scattered. Don't worry about that. That's not your concern anymore. The concern now is that if I become friends with Jesus, if I act right and do right and talk right and live right, no matter what damage I've done over the past, that can be healed. That damage can be rectified. It don't mean that everything is going to come back to place the way it was. God will fix it the way he knows it needs to be fixed, not the way you think it should be fixed. Somebody asked one time, as a pastor, you know, I, I, come, I, I come to know the Lord, and, 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 and my wife and I, we, we divorced, and I remarried. Am I supposed to divorce my wife and then and go back to my, uh, no, 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 no. No, sir. <laughs> and no, people ask that question because they want to do what's right. And we had some people say, yeah, now you got to you got to divorce them. The kids, you know, they're on their own. and You got to go back to your first right to, to rectify. I said, no, you don't. I said, this is where you receive Jesus and this is where you start. You start right here building your family. It don't mean to neglect those that, that's been part of your life, we may have to do something to correct some things and, and make whatever mistakes I've made in the past, make them as peaceful as possible. I have to do something. Praise the Lord. How do you, you, she might be mad at me, but I can't be mad at her. And I really I want to be part of those children's lives. Now, and if he don't want to get on board, that don't stop you from getting on board with Jesus. Y'all understand? God don't require the other person for you. He requires you for the other person. And you're the one that's going to benefit from it. Because at some point, people see, kids see, kids grow up. And when they grow up, they say, oh, no, daddy wasn't as mean as I thought he was. Well, Mama, you keep telling me he didn't want to see me. And he, been, he was writing me. He was, he was leaving cards for me. And you never gave them to me. You hurting yourself. So we have, to, we have to learn that life is short, and we want to make good decisions. And we can't make those decisions without Christ, having a relationship with God, having Christ in our life, a Holy Spirit leading and guiding us, giving us, helping us make the right decisions at the right time, and he'll bring out the best results. So Christian living, it's not the easiest life. It's the best, though. It's not the easiest, but it is the best. And it's something that we work at every day. You will never, ever master it. We just get better at it. Amen. Aren't you better? You should be better today. Amen. Than you were yesterday. And tomorrow, you're going to be better tomorrow than you are today because we're constantly learning and God is constantly teaching us. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord one more clap of praise. God is good. The Lord is good. We're going to pray. Everybody stand to your feet right now. We're going we're gonna to pray those of you, amen, who can. Stand with me. Stand with me. Forgot that was there. 
And, and I want you just to, just to lift your hands up toward heaven. Lift your hands up toward the Lord. Father, in Jesus' name. Lord, I give you thanks and I give you praise for this awesome time that you've blessed us to be here in your word. I thank you for your joy and I thank you for your strength. I thank you, Lord, for the power of the Holy Spirit that's present here right now. Teach us, lead us, guide us, comfort us. And whatever, Lord, we need, you have provided. Lord, our strength is in you and not in any other. Father, I just want to thank you for the Rise Church. I thank you for every person, every home that's represented here this morning, everyone watching through Facebook, Father, every home that's represented via social media. I just want to thank you, Lord, for all those that are present that heard the word, that has taken root in their heart and made a, a conscious effort, amen, to do more, to be better, to walk, to walk with God. Because now I know he's not requiring perfection. He just want my attention. And Lord, we want to give him our attention right now in Jesus' name. Because he wants to do for us. So Jesus, take the reins. Jesus, guide my heart. Holy Spirit, impact my mind. Let me and allow me to have the mind of Christ. To be obedient servant, not disobedient. I thank you for the gifts and fruits of the Holy Spirit. I have patience. I am gentle because, God, that's how you made me. And I'm getting better and better at it. Thank you, Lord, that you, I, I know today that I'm not perfect. I never can be perfect. But I can still walk with my Father on a daily basis. I can talk with you and laugh with you, communicate with you. I thank you for that privilege not only for me, Father, but for every one of us in Jesus' name. Now, if there's anybody that's here present, anybody via social media who have not given their hearts to the Lord, and they want to give their hearts to you, Jesus, they want that new life, all we have to do is reach out to ask God to come into my heart. Receive Jesus as their personal Savior. Father, I receive you in my heart. I receive your word. I thank you, Jesus, for dying for my sins. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. I believe that you died for me, that I may have a right to heaven. Thank you, Father. So right now, I give my heart to you. Lord, and the Holy Spirit will transform me. He will transform my mind and my heart. I'm not afraid anymore. I thank you for the peace, and I thank you for the joy in Jesus' name. That's all that's required. That's all God requires of us is to ask him, and he makes us brand new. Now, I thank you, Father, for those that have been made brand new, that started their new walk with you. I thank you, Lord, for those soldiers who's been in this battle and continue to hold up the blood-stained banner, walking day by day, confessing day by day. Those who have been in the trenches, praise the Lord. I thank you, Father, for strength, and we thank you for peace. In Jesus' name, we give you thanks and praise. Amen. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a clap. Just praise him. God is good. Hallelujah. The Lord is good. God bless you. you may be seated.